good morning. Wow, I'm, I am so honored to be here today with our award recipients and this incredible professional community of logisticians, our distinguished guests, our military leaders, and my fellow industry partners. Um, truly, thank you for letting me be here today. There couldn't be a more critical time to discuss the challenging issues that will be tackled this week and making the kind of connections which can drive the sorts of partnerships that deliver solutions. Our nation's excellence and agility in logistics is a differentiator not enjoyed by our would-be adversaries. It is both a deterrent to conflict and the key to prevailing should conflict erupt. Given the importance of the information that will be exchanged this week, you may be wondering why a former lobbyist is up here talking to you. You heard that right. Until recently, I was a registered lobbyist. I tried to find some good lobbyist jokes online to warm up the crowd here. Um, it proved harder than I thought that it would be. Maybe lobbyists are so unloved that unlike lawyers, no one even bothers to ridicule them. I don't know. So for now, I'll just stick with the old adage that I'm from DC and I'm here to help. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I disagree with that characterization of lobbyists, and you can hardly see my horns anymore, I know. Um, but back to my point, why am I up here? After all, we aren't here to get money from Congress, although I think everyone in this room can agree that uh, timely appropriations are very essential to the mission we have in front of us. But no, the perspective that I'm here to share today is one shaped by my time as a civilian member of the Defense Acquisition Workforce in the Navy and OSD, a professional staff member and then later the staff director on the House Armed Services Committee, and then five years now at Boeing trying to increase the value proposition that industry provides to DOD logistics and product support. My message to you is this. It is going to take all of us, the entire sustainment ecosystem, to achieve the effects and efficiency necessary to win a fight against the pacing threat. A nation that is serious about deterring a capable foe would abandon the stale us versus them view and finger pointing that occurs between DOD, Congress, and industry. Holding on to short-sighted stereotypes of DOD bureaucracy private sector greed or congressional incompetence will not make us better. Our adversaries are counting on us to embrace those tropes. They are counting on us to make the false assumption that today's American industry has the excess production capacity, labor, and supply chain depth to flip the switch into the same arsenal of democracy President Roosevelt heralded nearly 100 years ago. They are counting on our complacency to rely on Cold War era sustainment models while our fleets today are the smallest in history. They are certain our political polarization will keep Congress on the sidelines, or better yet, actively tie the military's hands behind their backs. It does not need to be this way. Serious leaders will set aside our assumptions about what can't be done and predictions of failures. Serious leaders will believe that different outcomes are possible and that good intent prevails among these stakeholders. And by leaders, I am not simply referring to the senior officers and SESs here today. They can provide guidance, but you, Everyone here, along with our airmen, sailors, soldiers, and Marines, can change the culture. Success is in your hands, and it is fitting that logisticians should lead the way. Why is that? Because of the answer to one simple question. Is anyone here in this room comfortable with our current readiness levels? No. How many more war games must we do with readiness assumptions that we know to be false? 
The other real reasons logisticians must lead the way for a new era of mission readiness is the hard reality that we go to war with what we have. Future platforms with greater range, reliability, stealth, speed, and sophisticated mission systems are a requirement to maintain technological superiority. But they are just that, future. They are a form of deterrence, but a vision not yet realized, not ready to field, not ready to train, and not ready to generate effects on the battlefield. No one is better suited to lead in these conditions than the professional logisticians gathered here this week. Facing into this challenge, we need to acknowledge that there is no single leader within the sustainment ecosystem, and that the stakeholders, the broad stakeholders, each have different measures of effectiveness and incentives. Therefore, absent unity of command, we must identify and prioritize actions that foster unity of effort. The first step toward unity of effort is communication, always. DOD, Congress, and industry must have common cause. We must share efforts to stabilize supply chains. We need a common understanding of the parts and critical materials that we most need to stockpile. We need to understand where we require investment to improve part reliability or to qualify additional sources or bring on additional infrastructure. Rather than pointing fingers, blaming each other, and seeking to minimize profit margins on the false notion that it will allow DOD to afford another widget, we should discuss the availability of resources while respecting a business's need for a return on investment in order to continue to operate. It is the return that seeds the next cycle of investment, which yields innovation. It also includes rethinking data sharing in a way that establishes trust, such as the S-Series standards for integrated product support. If you are not yet familiar with the S-Series specs, they are an essential enabler for reliably capturing and transmitting product support data, particularly as we migrate to a more digital environment. Current DoD product support standards were written by disparate organizations and are not integrated. They are open to interpretation, causing bespoke implementations. Furthermore, they lack common core data, the lack of a, they lack a common core data model, and cannot effectively support digital model-based systems engineering or the digital thread. Commercial industry, NATO, and many of our friends and allies are migrating to the S-series specs because they are an open source spec that informs and supports all 12 integrated product support elements across the life cycle of a system and provide a common integrated framework that is maintained and harmonized under a single international council structure. Indeed, there are other opportunities for unity of effort among allies. We should expand shared parts pools and MRO activities now to iron out any potential hiccups and identify any changes to ITAR or export controls necessary to enable success. As we think about future surge scenarios, where can the US government use the exact same parts procured through direct commercial sales for allies to fill their urgent needs? Even if those parts didn't come with all the US public policy certifications required by the FAR. These social policies are laudable, but in a high-end fight, I ask you, where is the greater risk? That when producing a bomb rack for a DCS customer, the US contractor failed to follow the FAR clause that required the use of double-sided copy paper with 30% recycled content, or that we failed to perform the mission or return a service member safely. We must iron these things out now. It cannot be overstated that one of the most important enablers for unity of effort is a common understanding of what our material readiness objectives are, how we measure progress to those objectives, and what resources are required to achieve those objectives. There can be no unity of effort if DOD, Congress, and industry don't understand what effects we seek to achieve. In fact, Congress has recognized the lack of shared understanding of readiness requirements and passed legislation which may have gone unnoticed. A few years ago, 
Congress established a requirement in Section 118 of Title 10, U.S. Code, for the service secretaries to establish material readiness objectives and metrics for each major weapon system. These material readiness objectives were supposed to be reported to Congress starting with the fiscal year 2023 budget request. To be clear, this is not the same thing as classified reporting on actual readiness rates. This reporting would reflect the service's unclassified assessment of the material readiness objectives for each weapon system required to support the national defense strategy and associated O plans. These objectives would be akin to Secretary Mattis's 2018 memo, which required the four TAC air platforms to achieve 80% mission capability ratings. The difference here is that these material readiness objectives are intended to be consistent across the services, across platforms, and span the test of time. Because the dirty little, not so very secret from, the tw from 2018 was that the 80% MC ratings were only achieved transitorily. The services each did the math differently, and no one could easily identify where the trade-offs in material readiness were being made on other platforms. Are there any enduring lessons learned from that effort? And it was an extraordinary effort. Are we doing anything differently? Have high MC rates become more affordable? I think not. Congress is hoping to change that with 10 USC 118. Once we have a shared understanding of material readiness requirements, the next logical step toward unity of effort would be greater use of outcome-based product support arrangements in lieu of short-term transactional approaches. Outcome-based product support arrangements are not a panacea, but they can work well if the objectives are clear. The customer gets to define the behaviors it seeks from its industry partners. They encourage industry investment where it matters most to the customer. Just as importantly, they allow businesses to operate as businesses rather than as a buying arm of the government. Allowing industry partners to behave as businesses puts more tools at the government's disposal because as we move away from transactional deals, we foster communication and encourage industry to take more risk. We learn from each other and can incorporate new processes and capabilities without arguing whether those efforts are in or out of scope. Outcome-based product support arrangements also enhance predictability for lower tier suppliers, which is critical to improving affordability and reducing lead time. For that matter, recognizing the value of Section 118, Congress took the material readiness objectives a step further in last year's National Defense Authorization Act. They mandated that future budget requests include an exhibit to show the annual O&M resources required to achieve these material readiness objectives by major weapon system across the future year defense program. This legislative requirement is an opportunity. It epitomizes the need to abandon the distrust of Congress that I mentioned earlier. I urge you not to think of this as another burdensome, non-value-added reporting mandate. Rather, this level of transparency is a huge chance to empower our product support managers, defend O&M resources in the, through the PBPE process, to hold Congress accountable for supporting readiness, and to hold product support providers, and I'm talking especially about industry here, accountable for spending these dollars as efficiently and effectively as possible to meet or exceed the outcomes you require. Why should industry care about this legislation? Defense budgets reflect our customers' priorities. DOD wants us to invest, to spur innovation, and to deliver excellence. And DOD should expect this. After all, our money spends differently than the government's money. But absent this kind of information that I'm talking about, that expectation is like going to the bank, asking for a loan, not to being able to tell the loan officer what you're going to use the money for, when you'll pay it back, or what terms you'd be willing to offer. The defense primes are often accused of not caring about sustainment. In fact, there is a reason that industry invests billions of dollars annually to advance RDT&E and procurement programs. The available budget information allows them to close the return on investment. Their lenders 
and shareholders expect nothing else, less, excuse me, because after all, there's an opportunity a cost associated with every investment dollar. To date, the transparency in the procurement and RDT&E budget request has not been available on the O&M side. This legislation, if implemented as intended, has the potential to change that, which matters because industry investment is an enabler of mission generation. I urge this community to be the leading voice inside DOD to ensure this legislation is implemented starting with the fiscal year 2025 budget request. You can make this happen. We can make this happen. While we're at it, let's talk about what we should expect from near-term innovation. The digital transformation of logistics, product support, and our depots is nascent. It's found in small pockets, but it's taking root. Ad adoption at scale is on the critical path to mission effectiveness within a contested logistics environment. For example, I spoke briefly about shared approaches to supply chain stabilization. The reality is that we cannot afford to expand supply chain capacity across the board, or even a lifetime buy of the Michelin, excuse me, mission essential list of a few key platforms. We will need to use predictive analytics to identify which parts are most likely to fail or need replacement for a given mission profile, to do anticipatory sourcing to drive availability, we must migrate from fleet level management with unattainable and unpredictable readiness and costs to a prescriptive model where the individual asset informs the system of what it needs. In the future state, dynamic parts positioning and advanced manufacturing may guarantee readiness in any environment. Our platforms should alert the right personnel of maintenance and training recommendations as the asset returns from its mission. The material condition of an individual asset can be known ahead of time. Long lead times can be planned, <clears throat> excuse me, long lead items can be planned for and drive affordability. While this sounds like the stuff of the future, digital transformation can't wait for next generation systems. It's actually imperative that we make the investments across the digital spectrum of our platforms from pre-digital to digitally enabled to digitally native. As we use the data now, our learning and TTPs will evolve, shaping the requirement for those future systems. And it's no longer an open question as to the benefits or relevancy of data from pre-digital platforms. We have proven that it is possible to reap significant benefits from our analytics from our workhorse systems that were not designed with model-based engineering or data reasoners. These benefits span asset availability, crew training, fuel savings, depot and supply support, and safety. Many of our allied militaries have been managing their fleets with these tools for years. In the Afghan airlift, our partners in the UK could identify by tail number which were the healthiest assets most likely to complete the mission. They trusted the data and their partners enough that they sent those aircraft with the spare parts on board most likely to need replacement during the operation. They listened to the aircraft and modified some ground procedures accordingly. They achieved mission success. In the US, we validated those results in select areas. For example, the Air Force conducted a C-17 data analytics demo at McGuire Air Force Base last year. The McGuire team saw a double-digit reduction in unscheduled maintenance. If those tools alone were adopted at scale across the Air Force's C-17 fleet, Boeing estimates that annually there would be the equivalent of six to seven additional available aircraft, millions of pounds of fuel savings, and safely keeping engines on wings longer. One of the barriers of adoption we commonly hear is debates over cost savings due to the absence of a baseline against which to compare or who reaps the benefits for those cost savings. With an aside that cost savings is not the only or even primary benefit here, I'll acknowledge that there are lots of contributors to the lack of a sustainment baseline. But I go back to the theme of unity of effort and sharing of information across multiple stakeholders. If implemented correctly, 
the new congressional direction in 10 USC 118 should create a common baseline against which everyone can measure the value of these digital, the, uh, these digital tools. The other common concern we hear is who owns the data. In the McGuire demo that I just mentioned, it was the Air Force's data coming in and the Air Force's data coming out. This should be the model. Industry can bring a variety of tools and software to better understand and act upon that data, especially when informed by an OEM's knowledge, but the data is the services. And given the velocity of innovation in artificial intelligence and machine learning, the tools embraced by the military should have open architectures, allowing adoption of best of breed solutions. Nevertheless, despite all the promise that digital transformation has to offer, logistics is ultimately a human endeavor. It is about relationships, communication, that unity of effort I keep speaking of, which is nourished by data and transparency. You can't just flip a switch and generate a robust logistics capability. Digital tools aid, but do not replace the human in the loop. Data helps make more informed decisions, higher velocity and better outcomes, but it takes practice, planning, and resourcing to make logistics flow when the warfighter needs it. Therefore, I urge us to go further Embrace the authorities Congress has provided, and let's get more creative about prototyping logistics. In Section 4022 of Title 10 U.S. Code, Congress has made it clear that they take an expansive view of prototyping and rapid acquisition. They encourage the use of other transactions to increase velocity, demonstrate capability, fail early, and solve tough problems. Specifically last year, Congress clarified that a prototype project includes prototyping models and processes, including business processes, reverse engineering to address obsolescence, piloting novel commercial technologies, the development of operational utility, and other activities. It is broad. There are re is real opportunity here to experiment together with new logistics concepts and drive human learning. Moreover, repeated demonstration of allied cooperation on logistics, military proficiency, industrial agility, and mission generation within contested environments will have a deterrent effect. Better yet, you have congressional support. Run with it. The current Congress is a mixed bag when I think about their appetite for acquisition reform writ large. I don't get the impression that they want to go after large reforms to the federal acquisition regulation. However, they are laser focused on improving readiness for the pacing threat. This is welcome news, as readiness can sometimes fall by the wayside. You see, readiness doesn't have a constituency. Readiness doesn't vote. But there are moments, as we saw about 10 years ago, when non-combat related fatalities and class A and B mishaps were on the rise, that readiness makes the news and Congress intervenes. At that time, members began to understand that the Budget Control Act and sequestration were impacting military training. The military continued to execute its missions with additional risk, as the service chiefs and vices would testify. But the non-combat related fatalities and low mission capable rates were avoidable, at least in part, if Congress intervened. We are in a similar moment now. Again, the logistics community can play a leadership role. You are professionals that don't stand around admiring a problem. You find solutions. Ask for resources. Ask for regulatory barriers to be removed. Articulate what help you need. Congress is poised to be responsive. For example, we must move past the just-in-time inventory management approach. The right parts need to be in the right place at the right time, and it will take planning and forecasting to build up critical assets in advance and have sufficient supply chain resiliency. This may require changes to fiscal policy. We may need some relief on buying ahead of need. Are there places to generate savings to pay for this? And do we need congressional buy-in to harvest those savings? Are there ways to generate more shared value in public-private partnerships? Do we need working capital funds to get a resource injection to buy smarter? This is another example of a space for expanded partnership. 
Industry can be your voice on the Hill and elsewhere in the Pentagon. This needn't be taboo. Engage trade associations. Trade association members truly are hungry for ways to advance their customers' interest. If we work together, like Aerospace Industries Association, for example, has done with the Navy on a legislative proposal that would advance international product support capabilities in contested environments, we can find a path to solutions. Industry will lean in to express its support and expend their political capital, even when there is no direct financial benefit. The benefit is generating learning for our customers and ourselves. Similarly, industry can provide, excuse me, can play a role in advocating to protect training, investments in initial spares and support equipment for new programs, and other vital, but often vulnerable, areas of the budget request. As well, although the private sector and the organic depots occasionally compete for work, I expect you would find that many in industry would advocate for resources for the depots in terms of facilities, technology, workforce development, because a healthy industrial base benefits the nation. And speaking of organic maintenance and competition, data rights is another area ripe for innovation and setting aside old arguments of the past. It's a complicated subject. I'm not a lawyer. And it's easy to offer platitudes during an address like this. But my observation is that DOD and its industry partners could significantly advance negotiations about data rights by reframing the issues in terms of data access instead of data ownership or delivery. We are increasingly seeing the government attempt to mandate industry relinquish intellectual property as an evaluation factor in the acquisition process. This is contradictory to the recommendations of a congressionally chartered government industry panel, called the 813 panel, that evaluated the competing interests of DOD and industry as it relates to IP. Certainly, the panel identified the use of data rights as an evaluation factor as a specific area of tension. The panel, reiterating current law, agreed that DOD should ensure IP was properly valued when used as an evaluation factor without mandating an offer or relinquish it. We have seen the rise in the use of contract-specific H clauses that contradict statute. The 813 panel identified the use of H clauses in this way as problematic and recommended that the DOD IP cadre, there is such a thing, develop negotiable templates, review proposed new service and agency H clauses, and provide recommendations to include whether the clauses are consistent with the DFARs including specially negotiated licensing rights. If these recommendations have not yet been implemented, these are steps DOD could take immediately to make greater use of its internal experts, freeing up resources to accelerate the velocity of contracting. I think we can all agree that government needs to be able to operate and maintain its equipment. Remote maintenance and repair in contested environments will be the new norm. Access to technical data to return an asset to service should never be an issue. Moreover, we should all be able to agree on the benefits of competition. It makes us better. But there is a difference between providing DOD access to tech the technical data it needs to maintain and repair its equipment and delivering detailed technical and manufacturing data so DOD can turn it over to a third party who hasn't invested in nickel. That's actually anti-competitive. Likewise, we must ensure that IP practices do not discourage industry private investments or push more companies out of the defense sector. Even if the prime contractors are willing to relinquish IP rights to win contracts, as the 813 panel pointed out, lower tier suppliers and their investors, especially those providing commercial or entirely privately developed technologies, are unlikely to be incentivized by or willingly agree to such terms. This will result in prime contractors not being able to incorporate the most advanced capabilities into their proposals or incorporate them later during contracted engineering and sustainment efforts. Back to the unity of effort theme, we must ensure that practices regarding data rights do not undermine other actions DOD is taking to increase new industrial base participants and counteract the overall shrinking trend of the shrinking of the defense industrial base. 
adherence to the balanced statutory framework that Congress has established, focusing on access to technical data when, as and when needed, and implementation of equitable solutions to encourage competition, such as modular open systems architectures, these practices encourage private investment and multiple market participants and incentivize both traditional and non-traditional contractors to offer innovative solutions to DOD. As I bring my remarks to a close, I'll also highlight the underappreciated benefit of innovation, velocity, and maximizing market participation. It has the beneficial second order effects of, on the defense workforce, uniformed and civilian. The logistics community is constantly under strain, even to support DOD's core mission areas short of major combat operations. In a high-end fight, this community is at the tip of the spear. As we prioritize investments in innovation, experimentation, and partnerships, we should also consider advancements that build resiliency into the logistics workforce. Otherwise, we will never free up the vital human resources to attack the really hard problems. In the end, empowering talented people unified by mission is always a smart bet. I'll conclude by thanking you for your time. I continue to seek ways to serve, and you've given me that opportunity today. The defense of our country and its national security interests is paramount. I was humbled to have been given the slot right before our next visionary speaker, General Mike Monahan. Uh, I thank you all for the spirit of service that pervades this room, no matter what organization is on your badge. Let's use the remainder of our time to exercise leadership and to cultivate the partnerships that drive unity. With that, I'm gonna leave you with the only good lobbyist joke I found. A Kentucky Fried Chicken lobbyist goes to a meeting with the Pope. He offers a donation of $10 million if the Pope agrees to change the words in the Lord's Prayer from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. The Pope apologizes and says he can't do it. He's not interested. A hundred million dollars, says the Kentucky Fried Chicken lobbyist. The Pope still shakes his head, says no, explains that these words are sacred. One billion dollars, that's my final offer, says the KFC lobbyist. Ooh. After some consideration, the Pope reluctantly agrees to the deal. He returns to the Vatican and calls all of his cardinals together. I have good news and bad news, the pontiff says. The good news is I've secured $1 billion for the church in our work. The bad news is we've lost the Wonder Bread account. <laughs> have a great rest of your day. Thank you.